All right. Good morning, Doug. We're back with questions from members of our file. That's our private member network. Uh, you can find out more about it if you're interested in the description below this video. We have questions from members of the file, Doug, and let's start. The first one is, what's your opinion on claims that we've reached peak oil? Oh, well, hmm. the concept was first broached, I believe, by M. King Hubbard starting in the 70s. Uh, and I first became familiar with it when um, he wrote an article for Scientific American. It must have been 20 years ago anyway. And um, I, I subscribed to Scientific American at the time. I don't currently, but um, that's where he put it forward. And basically, what is peak oil? Uh, and as I remember Harvard's description defining the term, peak oil is the um, easy availability, economic availability of um, light, sweet, crude. That's what you want. That's what you want is light, sweet, crude. Uh, the stuff that made the Beverly Hillbillies rich, okay? Uh, and he was well aware of the uh, tar sands in the Athabasca region of Alberta. He was well aware of the uh, heavy oil in Venezuela, which is actually, to our knowledge, the largest deposit in the world. So he wasn't talking about that. And he wasn't talking about fracking, which is a way of recovering oil either. He was talking about conventional oil. And I think he was right. Now, fracking is the breakthrough that turned everything on its head. I mean, I'm recalling these numbers out of my head, but um, see how close I can come. If the US produces about 12 million barrels a day, about three or 4 million are from conventional oil, stuff with the, the rig, you know, just see. Uh, and the rest, 7 million or 8 million barrels a day, is fracking product, okay? So um, basically, he was correct. Uh, I mean, there's got to be a lot more oil at 10,000 or maybe 15,000 feet down, but it becomes very economic to, uh, to reach out and get it. And there's a lot of oil that's mined and refined in Athabasca and the heavy oil in Venezuela, that all happens. But he was talking about light, sweet oil, okay? And I think he was right, quite frankly. But that term has come to mean something entirely different since then, don't you think? Uh, peak oil. So you think people mean it now as though oil in general is running out or that the economic recovery of all oil types is ending? Yeah, well, it's just everything is a question of price. I mean, we're never going to run out of oil, just running out of cheap oil. That's all. Uh, so right now, oil is around $70. And it seems to me that it's kind of reasonably priced because uh, the marginal cost I mean, the average cost, let me put it that way, of producing oil, and it, it depends vastly on where you are and this and that and the other thing, but it's around $60 a barrel or something like that, so oil companies can make money, but it's kind of a businessman's return. So uh, with the third world continuing to develop, which I expect it will be, uh, oil consumption in the developed world, Japan, Europe, the US, Canada, has been flat for many years. I mean, we've gotten very efficient with, uh, with using oil. But uh, it doesn't matter whether consumption in third world countries like India and China and other places it goes up or not. What, what matters is the availability, the easy availability of light, sweet crude, and that is dropping. So peak oil is a real thing. Okay. But, but don't I... worry about it. So oil goes to 100. There's all kinds of oil, like, for instance, uh, conventional oil, 
white sweet crude, which is what we want. I mean, it used to be they'd drill a hole, they couldn't get any more. Then the next thing they came up with was water flooding, where you pump it full of water and it drives more oil out. And even now, with secondary recovery, uh, you're only getting, let's see, if you get a third through primary recovery, then you get another 20 or 30 or 40 percent through secondary recovery. And there's tertiary recovery, uh, more advanced methods. So there's still plenty of oil down there. It's just a question of, well, how can we get basically 100 percent of the oil out of the well? Hmm. They're not dry. You just can't recover most of most of the oil is still down there. So don't worry about it. Nothing that the price mechanism can't solve. On the other hand, the government will find some way to screw it up. Yeah, I think they're trying to. Okay, uh, next, next question. Have you seen uh, Putin's speech where he gives his take on Western civilization? And if so, what do you think of it? I thought it was great. Uh, if I believed in voting, which I don't, uh, I would vote for Putin based upon that speech. It was a fantastic speech. I mean, he uh, debunked the Russian Revolution, the Soviet Revolution, if you would, uh, 1917, and talked about how corrupt it became and, uh, and lauded uh, the values of Western civilization and uh, debunked wokeism in particular. So, uh, you know, I, I, look, I've said for years, you don't get to be the head of a major nation state without doing all kinds of nasty things and then having to continue doing nasty things because you're maintaining basically a, a crappy superstructure. And if you want to maintain it, you've got to, it's based on force. So you have to continue to use force to keep it propped up. So, okay, uh, is Putin a good guy? I think he's actually a better guy than most of the world's leaders, certainly more intelligent. Uh, so uh, the fact that he's being turned into a devil, uh, the new Adolf Hitler, if you would, and I'd point, I'd hasten to point out that Hitler was not as bad a guy by any means as Mao or Paul Pot for that matter, or Stalin for that matter. But uh, well, those were all communists, so. <laughs> They're basically forgive those back. sins. Forgive those yeah, sins. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, uh, I'm going to post that. Um, that well, uh, I'll put a link under in the description of the video also because everyone should watch it. It's it's surprising. It's the things that you would hope that uh, you know you would hope would come out of the mouths of uh, our politicians, but it's, those it's absolutely perverse. You're absolutely right, but there's no way in hell. Well. They're pathological and chronic and enthusiastic liars. So they'll say anything. But they I might. think it was sincere. I think it was sincere on Putin's part. Here's so, especially because that uh, you know the primary mark uh, market for that speech is his domestic market. You would think, because because you know Putin's speeches don't get much play in the West, yeah, because when they're in the Russian, so you have to see translations of them, and that yeah. just doesn't for the primary market. Exactly. And I don't think it was directed towards foreign government leaders because foreign government leaders would would not like that speech. No. So, yeah, so as for his domestic market. So kudos, kudos to Putin. Yeah, now, now you're a Putin apologist, it sounds like, but that's okay. Well, I, 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 I guess so. I, I must be on his payroll. Must be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's see. Next question. What are your thoughts on DeSantis as a as a presidential candidate? He announced this week that he was going to run on Twitter famously. Well, with any U.S. politician, I don't think you ever really know what you're getting. People forget uh, the most famous U.S. politician of the last century uh, was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And most people are totally and completely unaware of the fact that when he ran against Hoover, Herbert Hoover uh, in 1932, he ran as a free tax, free market, low tax, deregulation guy, just the opposite of what Hoover was. Hoover was a real dirigiste. And then, of course, he flipped 100% once he was in office. So 
if you're going to be a successful American politician, you have to be a pathological liar, a skill right. liar, and an enthusiastic liar. I mean, it's all about you can embrace it. We are. So um <laughs> well what do you, so what do, you, what do you think of DeSantis? Keep it give that in mind. Yeah, well, look, what he's done so far in Florida, being anti-woke. Uh, okay, everybody likes anti-woke. That's great. Uh, it, it seems like he's taking things from Trump's platform that seem to work and playing that chord on the fiddle. But I don't know who this guy really is. I mean... I don't know how much he's read. I don't know what he really believes. Do, do you know? I, I don't know. All I do know, all I remember is that he was a congressman for a long time and he was, you know, part of the as conservative coalition in Congress from time to time. And uh, he he came off then as a just just a plain vanilla conservative. And I, I, I he did make speeches then he did you know, talk in Congress. And so there, we could find out what he, what he really believed then compared and how does that change him as his governor. But I think one of the more obvious and certainly surface level things that you see about him is that his style has completely changed in light of Trump. Uh, what I mean by that is that he, if you look at his speeches before Trump, he didn't have, he didn't talk the way he talks now. He didn't, but he has copied Trump's mannerisms. He uses his gesticulations with his hands. Like he does the same things that, that, that Trump does, you know, the, like that thing. He does all of that. And it's, it's weird. He's, he's, he's picked, he's mirroring Trump in many ways. So I think what you're saying about his platform is true as well. Good point. And the fact that he does that makes me very suspicious that it's he doesn't killer. have real values. Of course, <clears throat> Trump doesn't have real values either. I did a uh, an article in in the that that in in the book totally incorrect back in 2012 or the 2011 actually when Trump was first toying with running for office, and I said then he's got no core values. He's got no interest in philosophy or economics per se, he just flies by the seat of his pants. And he said numerous times back then that he could run either as a Republican or a Democrat. Well, okay, the fact that he's a cultural conservative kind of ruled out the Democrats at that point. But the fact that he said that tells, and DeSantis, I'm afraid, is cut from the same cloth. I mean, sure, we like him more than Biden and the Jacobins that are running Washington now. But uh, w would I support him? No, I, I see no reason to support him. He's no Ron Paul, that's for sure. Yeah. So, uh, look, don't get enthusiastic about DeSantis. You're just playing the game, okay? Yes. And it's a stupid game to play. You're just a pawn in the game if you decide to. You're not even a pawn if you play it. <laughs> You're like a holographic pawn. And there are millions of you out there who support DeSantis because you think he's going to save the republic. The republic is too late to save from a political point of view anyway. Forget about it. Right. And I, th I think because most people have a sense of uh, intellectual honesty, if they trick you into supporting, you know, the, you know, the two-party system in any way and voting, if they trick you into that, into believing one is better than the other and you actually have a say in it, then... In, from an intellectual uh, honesty standpoint, you have a very hard time uh, criticizing the entire system. You know, so so basically, because you because you participate at all, it almost it's the exact opposite of what people often say. It takes away your right to be critical of the system rather than um, giving you a right to be critical of the system. That's exactly that's a very good point, Matt. It's like people say, well, <clears throat> if you don't vote, it's your fault. No, au contraire. If you do vote, you're complicit in it. You're 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 participating. You're you're yes, you are a participant in a known fraud. That's what's yeah. going on. <laughs> I, I mean, it shows that you're a sucker, a, a mooch. Quite frankly, I mean. Yeah. Well, but also it's like it's so easy because humans are so easy to manipulate. Actually, because we all like to. It's it, all you have to do is create a binary. 
and people will naturally filter what's to one side of that binary and they'll be like, but you have to choose, choose. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it doesn't work. Obviously. No, it doesn't. <laughs> so I wish DeSantis would, would go away because I'm not a supporter of Trump, but choosing between Trump and the Democrats, well, basically there's no choice. You have to go for Trump because he's at least a cultural conservative. Yeah, that's a plus. Yeah. Not that screw everything else up, I'm sure. Yeah. Okay, next question is, uh, do you think there's a future for carbon offsets uh, like carbon streaming or might the implosion cause other issues to deal with? Also, any thought for bankrupt of, for bankruptcy of insurance companies coming due due to increased payouts for deaths related to the uh, you know the jab? Well, so first of all, do you think carbon yeah. streaming. Do you think carbon credits is going to continue no matter what? Well, the, so much of this last one point seven trillion dollars. I don't know where all that money has gone. I don't think anybody knows where that last one point seven trillion dollars went. Quite frankly, I mean, it's too much money to account for. But uh, I guess a lot of it was to fight global warming or to fight our new enemy element, carbon or, or whatever. And um, I've speculated in some of these carbon stocks. I mean, the whole idea is based on a fraud, quite frankly. I mean, it's just, it's just a horrible swindle from start to finish. Um, and they've treated me okay because they're trading sardines, not eating sardines. But um, okay, so that answers that question. I mean, really, don't touch them. I mean, some of the companies that are involved in this that are building carbon credits because they're in the mangroves as opposed to this. Yeah, okay, that that might work out. I don't know. But uh Stay away from that stuff because it's based on something that's going to collapse to zero eventually. Uh, and the second part of the question was what? What do you think about insurance companies uh, getting hit through, uh, you know, having high increased payouts related to, ah. or, but even even more so than the insurance payouts to the desk, Doug, is that like the same thing that's hit the regional banks, doesn't that affect insurance companies even more? Mm. The How, the the interest rates going up? Well, the well, I, I thought the question was directed towards with the um, vaccines. It was yes. Killing people would affect the insurance companies more. I think it's actually affected um, companies that sell disability insurance. I think have already been affected, but I haven't made a study of who's really big in selling disability insurance. I think the biggest used to be Union Mutual called Unum. That was one. And uh, there were a few other companies that were big in selling disability insurance. And I understand that they've been hurt very badly by disability. But what do you know about actual deaths? Have they gone up generally? Because it wasn't COVID that killed anybody. Yeah. Just I... old people that were going to die anyway, or fat people. Old fat people, old fat, sick people. Well, what do you expect? You're 80 years old, you're old, fat, and sick. You're going to die pretty soon. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I haven't seen the uh, any of the the death charts recently that would you know attract like uns. I can't remember the term they used for excess deaths. I haven't seen that lately to see if it's uh, if it's grown above where it was. But I mean, most developed countries were, you know, double digits above above the uh, the normal death. Well, insofar as it's possible on the part of the powers of be, I would think they would try to wash those numbers, including outfits like BlackRock and Vanguard that basically control the financial world and stocks and so forth. So, so I don't know, because, you know, there's... There's no honest information out there. And insofar as we're getting honest information, it's patchy because nobody can talk about this. It's like it's like talking about things like race. I mean, you can't talk about race 
anymore other than to say you can't be a racist okay that's fine you can you can say that but that's all you can say about racial differences between human populations and it's the same thing with you know who's dying and are they dying of covid or did they die of a motorcycle accident with covid which is you know i don't know i look for these numbers but i can't i can't find them and when i find them i can't be sure of their honesty because it's so highly politicized i mean yeah, I, yeah, I'll, I'll link to a, a place where people can see excess, they call it excess mortality. If the data set is right, um, it actually shows, so it was elevated different periods, and then it got below the, the expected rate in uh, back in March of 2022, it kind of raised above that again, and now is basically below the expected rate again, it's down 5%, excess mortality is down 5% uh, as of April 9th. So, I mean, you would think if they were having these huge redemptions or huge payouts, these insurance companies, it would have been, it would have been argued, you know, we would have seen it more, we would have found something out about right. it. Right. There's no way of dodging that. I mean, right. So, the insurance companies are making big payouts. So yeah, who 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 really knows? We'll we'll find out in the long run. Yeah. Okay. Disability insurers is an interesting one. I, I haven't looked at those. I'll see. I can go look at some of them, the whichever publicly traded ones I can find. Um, okay, next question. Uh, you said it'd be interesting to hear your take on what conditions in your home country should make you seriously consider leaving and what conditions are the minimum for the country to go to? At what yeah. position do you consider uh, the U.S. or a state in the U.S. unviable? He says before, before it's obvious to everyone else. And what would attract you to another country or state? Seems to me we've talked about that <clears throat> many, many, many times since we've been doing these conversations. True. It's true. But like, is there something, you know, the state of things in the U.S.? I was just there for a couple of weeks. You're going to be there soon. Is there any signal, though, that of things that you see that would make you not? Like it, like it, what would have to happen in the U.S. this summer for you to cut your summer vacation or summer season there short? Is there anything? Mm. Yeah, would there be anything in particular? Well, you would have thought that the lockdown during the COVID hysteria would have been enough in itself, except just about every country in the world was locked down. So you can run, but you can't hide on that one. But, uh, and of course, up and coming are central bank digital currencies so that your money won't be your own. Not that what you have is money, it's just digits that are, are on your computer. It's a little bit different from real money, which is gold coins or to a lesser degree, silver coins. You know, it's, it, it's, it, it's a, a gradient. So at what point on the slope do you want to draw the line? Uh, and it's a slippery slope besides. So will it be foreign exchange controls are imposed uh, in earnest in the U.S.? We've had them in the past, but they've come and gone. Will that be it? Uh, could it be really serious wage and price controls that once the, since now the Jacobins are in office, they would be serious this time. It wouldn't be semi-reluctant wage and price controls like that idiot Nixon imposed back in the 70s. Um, where do you draw the line when they start uh, rounding up political dissidents in the yeah. dark night? Well, they do that now, but it's kind of a kinder and gentle, gentler kind of rounding people up like Roger Stone and many, many others. I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah, it's hard to say when when you draw that line, especially I think the important thing from you know, the things you've talked about for decades has always been that you have optionality in other jurisdictions so that you, it's not a problem to spend time, you know, there because the risks to you are lower because you have capital and you have a right to live in lots of other places. So with that, you know, the, the question is, I think, when you to leave initially, um, you know, what is it that has to be 
that it might convince you to do that. And I think if that hasn't happened in the last three years, if you haven't seen evidence in the last three years that would make you seriously question what happens in your home country, then I don't know if there will be a line, you know, that that you need to see. Do you know what I mean? Like if you if you weren't convinced by the lockdowns or how they were handled locally or that or what they did with the the BLM protests or, you know, with the vaccine mandates or the travel restrictions, if you weren't if those things in your local area didn't convince you, then I don't know what would. Yeah, exactly. So if you haven't already taken action to diversify geographically, diversify politically, then um, well, you probably never will. And I suspect that most people never will because they're they're rooted to where they are and uh, perhaps they can't afford it. But if you can't afford it, whose fault is that? Well, I'd say it's your fault for not working hard enough or working long enough or not cutting your expenses enough to give yourself some optionality. But you should do it right now. I, I don't know where the line is. The line is different for everybody, depending on their personal situation. True. Okay, here's a, uh, what are your, what's your view on uranium, uranium stocks over the next 12 months? Do you have any opinion? Yeah, I love uranium. I mean, uranium stocks are in the same position now, more or less, <clears throat> that they were back in, um, eh, what was it? Was it 2000, 2001, it was in that area? Uh, so right now, let's say uranium is about $50 a pound. So it's more or less about the marginal price of mining another pound of uranium. And my guess is, since wind and solar are going to be shown to be frauds and shams, I mean, yeah, they're useful in certain applications in certain places, no question about it. I'm not opposed to them in principle. I'm all for them in principle. But uh, I'm not... <laughs> Only an idiot can be for uh, imposing them on an entire country as the main source of energy. They're not suitable for a mass industrial civilization. So what do you come up with? Coal, coal is great, uh, but it's got problems. Oil, well, you got one thing left, uranium. So I'm a real bull on that, uh, on, on uranium. All right. Uh, next question is uh, preppers versus international men. Uh, who makes it during? Who makes it better during the the Greater Depression? You know, if you're if you're somebody who is a, a prepper, basically somebody who basically is stockpiled stuff, has access to you know I don't know lots of squirreled away resources, or does somebody do better when they're they just when they're internationally focused and they can just get up and go? Well, why do we have to make a choice? Why can't you be an international man and a prepper? I mean, you're a perfect example of that. I like that. I definitely, <laughs> I'm also a perfect example of that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I don't think it's binary, that's for sure. I mean, the whole thing is trying to uh, increase your, your optionality for future freedom and to make sure that you can't be, you know, the obvious bottlenecks on that freedom cannot be closed easily. You know, whether it's access to supplies you need in the short term, and whether it's by a government or by a because of a natural disaster. Yeah, no matter where you are, uh, you want to have a comfortable crib. So you ought to have stuff that you need if things change a little bit. And it doesn't matter if that where you are is in the U.S. or in South America or Australia. It doesn't matter where you want the same. You should be a prepper everywhere where you have a you have a house. Great. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you've seen these memes around the the current thing is what they call it, and that's basically it says the meme is I support the current thing, and that current thing could have been BLM, oh, you know, it could have been that's funny. Oh yeah, and then and, and then the little robotoid is waving a Ukrainian flag. Yes, yeah, so that's cute. It's the current thing. So what do you think the next thing is going to be? What's, oh, do you have any idea? Hmm. The next what, current it, thing. Yeah, the next thing. Well, I guess the next thing, 
I'm not sure if people are supposed to support it or not, is artificial intelligence. I mean, that's what's in the news right now. But I think people are, are, are people confused about whether they should support it or not, because there's certainly nothing they can do about it. I mean, nobody's going to put up, uh, you know, posters in front of their house saying, I support AI. I'm not sure that would solve a useful, serve a useful purpose for anything. It has to be a social justice thing. It has to be a yeah. honest something. Eventually, it gets to that where basically they'll argue with it that uh, AI should have rights, just like humans should have rights. Eventually, I think it does get to that. But it will come down to that, right? But right now, we've got COVID, where we still have people running around wearing masks even today, uh, and it'll reassert itself in some form. So that's one thing. And you've got uh, climate change. That's the big thing. I mean, that, they've been, that's been building momentum for decades at this point. So that's not going away. That's, that's so big, you actually don't need another thing. The climate is all encompassing, if you would. And then you've got war in the Ukraine. Yeah, that's, so those are three big ones. Uh, do, we, do we need another one? I'm sure yeah. there will be another one. There, there, there definitely must be some but the, with all of these, they came out of nowhere. You know what I mean? It was like all of them showed up like black swans, whether the BLM thing, you know, black swan thing that if you, if you were a, cor a corporation, and you weren't posting a black box on your Instagram, then, then people thought that you were evil. Your employees were revolting against you. I mean, it was like, there was a lot of pressure for that. That was a big one. And then of course, definitely with the, you know, 14 days to slow the spread with the, yeah, right, right. <laughs> and then, and then, uh, and then the Ukraine one, all those just popped up out of nowhere, though, and became like this mass meme all at once. So I don't know, I, I, whatever it'll be, I assume it'd be a black swan type. I mean, meaning it's unknown to us today what it could be, because it has to be no, something I, with opposition. There's no built in opposition for it. That's the key thing. No, there's not. No, it's, um, well, it's like Roseanne, Roseanne and Dennis said, said, if it's not one thing, it's something else. It's always something. So she was so right. So right. Yeah. Yeah. So well, I, look, I mean, listen, we live on a planet. There's supposed to be like 8 billion so called humans out here. Most of them are just not even a standard deviation above the chimpanzee. And chimpanzees are irrational and volatile and dangerous. And I think uh, people have proved that adequately in the last, well, throughout history, but especially in the last couple of decades. So uh, I'm sure there'll be something else. But what is it? The question is, what is it going to be? But wait a minute, if it's a black swan, by its very nature, it's totally unpredictable. You don't even know it exists. That's, that's what a black swan is. That's why I think that I think the only element that I can see as a repeated pattern is that there is no built in opposition to it. And that's why I don't think it'll be climate change, because there are a lot of people who are. That has opposition, it has opposition. I mean, you know, the current thing is like a senseless meme where everyone wants to post a flag icon for it somehow on their profiles. You know, they just adopt it like fools. So, yeah, but I, I think there can't be built in opposition. That's the key. Because no one was against you. You know, no one was against uh, black people. No, you know, not, it's like the most racist country in the world. I mean, no, no one is against black people. So it's like, so no. it was easy. You're right. I mean, I am absolutely not against the Ukraine. I'm absolutely not against black people, but they made it into a thing. You know, it works. Like, yeah, it only, it only works when there's like this empty spot, and people say they haven't figured out how they. You know, there's there can't be opposition to it. That's the only way it can filter in so easily. Yeah, it, it's like that moron George Bush. He said, if you're not with us, you're against us. Yep. Well, well, George, I, I really don't give a damn about you or anything. You know. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Um, let's see, a question relating to energy stocks. Uh, can, Doug, can, how will you handle oil and other energy investments if there's a recession and energy commodity prices drop? Buy more and hold through the drawdown? 
Well, the question really is, I'm very concentrated now in energy stocks and mineral stocks, heavy on gold, but copper and uranium and everything else. But the question is, uh, so the question really is, where do you put your money? And what, what if it turns out that that's not working too well? Where's a better place to put your money? That's what, that's what the question really asks. I mean, why zero in on, on energy stocks in particular? Because they're selling it, you know, depending on the energy stock we look at, anywhere from two. Two to three times. Yeah, or, or maybe four or five or six or seven times earnings with big dividend yields. So, um, gee, I don't know where a better place to be is with whether we look at it with individual securities and go bottom up or in the macro and go top down. I, frankly, listen, if you can show me a better place, please show me. I'm anxious. I really am. I mean, hey, I'm sorry that I didn't know about NVIDIA and didn't know what was going to happen. Sorry. But, you know, that ship has sailed. I'm not going to buy NVIDIA now. Hey, hey, you think 29 times sales is is fairly priced, so there's no more upside? Hey, hey listen, maybe it'll go to a 50 or 100 times sales. I mean, that's possible. Could happen. Yeah, I guess. But, I guess. you know, you know I, I'm not of a mind. I'm not like one of these guys that, <clears throat> that uh, if, they, if it's raining outside and two guys watch raindrops going down a, uh, a window and they'll place a bet on which one reaches the bottom first. I don't want to do that. No. No, well, in our, in our, uh, in, in file, in a, our pro and VIP levels, we have a portfolio and I'm just looking at one of the, I'm not going to mention the name of the stock, but one of them there is, uh, according to Yahoo Finance, is currently paying a 35% dividend. So I'm okay with keeping my money there if I'm getting that, if, even if the price goes down. Yeah, there's political risk, yep. obviously, in that case. But, um, you know, politicians come and go. And unless a country actually turns into, actively turns into a Zimbabwe or a Venezuela, that can happen. It can happen in the U.S. Uh, yeah, it's a good place to be. I mean, look, it wasn't the biggest hit, but it was the first big hit that I ever made in the, in the, in the markets, and it's different, was in South African gold stocks. And I've told this story before, but I'll mention it again. Uh, in 1976, which is a long time ago now, uh, people were talking and very much afraid of the collapse of South Africa and race war and all this type of horrible stuff. And gold had gone down in the, in the summer of 76 from $200 after it was freed in 1971. It ran up to $35 to $200. And then it went down to like $102 or something like that. So between the riots and the collapse, impending collapse of South Africa and gold looked like it was heading back down to $35 again, uh, these South African gold stocks were yielding 50, 60, 70% in dividends. And everybody said, well, of course. I mean, they're not only going to cut their dividends probably to zero, but they're going to be nationalized and disappear. That's why they're yielding so much. Well, I didn't buy the argument, perhaps foolishly. And, you know, by the time I sold those stocks and four years, five years later, uh, I sold them for, I was, I was getting many times in dividends when I, was, when I paid for the stocks, in dividends alone. So that's, a, that's an extreme anomaly, but it's burned in my mind because it was such a happy anomaly for me at that time. Uh, is that going to happen again with some of these oil stocks? Well, I don't know. You just have to play the odds. Yeah. You know, we, nobody's got a crystal ball. No, but... You know, it's it seems like it has further to fall or less far to fall if it's trading at three times versus companies like NVIDIA that are trading at, uh, you know, 29 times sales. And also 
you know, subject to global demand, I think you have those chips are on the same level probably that oil is in terms of being, if there's a recession, there's impacted by that as oil would be impacted. So there's not really many safe places to go instead. Yeah, and it's going to be a lot harder. Oil is a lot more useful in a lot more places and a lot more essential than chips are. And it, it's harder to create oil out of nothing. But you can create chips out of nothing. That's what happens with chips. Exactly. Okay. Uh, what do you think about you know, our current uniparty in the U.S.? Is it akin to monarchy? Um, well, it's an oligarchy, in effect. And um, look, it, it's the deep state. And the deep state are people who's the center of their lives is the basically inside the Washington Beltway. And we're talking about, I'm guessing, how many people are actually top dogs in the deep state, top dogs? Well, you got some generals, you got some heads, heads of big deal agencies, you got some congressmen, not all senators, but most of the senators, a lot of them, uh, a lot of people in the executive branch. You got heads of certain corporations, good number of them. There's probably, I don't know, a thousand or something like that, uh, 2,000, who knows? Top dogs in the deep state, guys that pull the strings. They all know each other. Their kids go to the same schools. They think the same way they went to the same schools. They have the same views and philosophies insofar as they have such things. Uh, yeah. So the deep state exists. It's an oligarchy. Okay. All right. Next question from Jeff. He says, does Doug think it's possible that mind reading technology is already here? And is the reason the technocrats are confident in making their move to take over the world? Uh, no, it's not here. I mean, there are advances being made with hooking electrodes up to people's brains. And <clears throat> When you think certain things or feel certain things, certain parts of your brain are activated. And there's a lot of advances being made in that. But uh, they don't have electrodes hooked up to our brains yet. And yes, I know, Elon Musk wants everybody to have a chip in their brain. But I don't think, I'm personally of the opinion that Musk is basically a good guy. Uh, and if he put a chip in, if he's advocating for a chip in people's brains, it's because it's going to make it easier for them to access the internet or something like that, as opposed to be controlled. So, uh, yeah, but that's coming. It's all part of the singularity. You know, I think that the, what it's almost as good as mind reading is that most people's behavior patterns are very simple. And so like with big data, you, if you are observing somebody, just like they can tell, for instance, they, they can, you know, they could tell if uh, one of the stories is like uh, is that a, a girl gets coupons for uh, diapers before she knows she's pregnant based upon her purchase patterns at the grocery store. Um, you know, and there's and things like uh, um, you know you can basically because if you get enough to certain data selected on you, apparently like Facebook knew knows basically where where people go to the bathroom every day. Like because they can see based on geolocation on their phone where they are and where they go, like with going from one place to another, and they can tell actually when people are generally on the toilet because the uh -huh. data. So you don't have to read That's people's so minds because the behavior pattern is actually so predictable. Humans are not like, you know, really random. Honestly, they follow very strict patterns over and over again, and you know, you are very predictable and thus moldable through basic behavioral economics. That's a good point. And who is that bioscientist? What's his name, Calhoun, that built a perfect environment for rats, where they were basically in rat heaven. They had all the food, all the sex, it was completely safe, no predators. It was like a perfect rat world. Uh, and so they all reproduced and reproduced. And, and then the society reached a peak and it collapsed. And that was actually perfectly predictable. So not to say that people are like rats, but maybe we're conducting our own experiment on ourselves like that chap. I want to say his name was Calhoun, but I don't think it was. 
Uh, it was it was Calhoun, and it was called Rat Utopia. Ah, Rat Utopia, right. Good. Right. So, Rat Utopia. Did we live in Rat Utopia in the U.S. as late as the as late as the early nineties? Well, we'll find out. <laughs> we <will. laughs> okay. Um, Let's see. Uh, he says, is it right or wrong to become a derivatives, like an options and futures trader right now? He says, and is it good a good business given that many uh, members of the file are thinking about emigrating to a more peaceful region of the world? Yeah, well, becoming an options and commodity trader, good idea or a bad idea? Good idea if you're really good and really know what you're doing. Bad idea for, oh, I'd say, roughly 98% of people. So, um, look, I trade options and commodities, buy and sell them, and mostly sell options. And um, it's very, very hard to be right. And even if you're right for a long time, the market turns on a dime and wipes out months of profits for you. And you go back to, hopefully not right back to the starting line, but just above it and say, oh, I forgot, you know, something happens. Oh, I forgot about that. So, uh, and when you're trading options and commodities, especially because these things have giant leverage, giant leverage, um, you're fighting against some of the smartest guys on, on earth, some of the richest guys on earth. And these guys have really good information sources that are all crunched by giant computers with well worked out programs. So yeah, you can win, but don't plan your life around making a living from it, okay? It's, it's not a good bet. It's fun to do, and you should trade options and commodities just to um, force you to keep your eye on the ball, what's happening in the world, price of things. Yeah, that's one thing. But trying to make a living from it, no, no, that's, that's a mistake. And the other thing is living in mellower parts of the world, I think that's a good idea. That's a great idea. Well, you know, one of the the other thing that you didn't mention that can happen in these trades is if you're really right, it can be unwound. Uh, you know, so you have the people who are uh, against um, who are on, you're participating in GameStop where they're creating a short squeeze and against this hedge fund. And then those trades got unwound. I was personally, I had a uh, an op big options trade for me um, shorting one of the uh, junk bond index funds uh, in the pandemic, so before before the market collapsed, but then the Fed came in and was on the other side of the trade. They bought. They were they were literally buying the op. They were the opposite of the trade. So, I mean, it seems like if you get really, if you even if you get something really good, the system, if it's too good, the system will unwind it, take it away from you. Yeah, exactly. And we might have asked ourselves a few years ago, wow, when oil got down to two dollars a barrel. How can I go along? I'm going to bet the farm, go along a bunch of contracts. And then it went down to minus 35 and you would have been totally wiped out and worse. Yeah, that's right. Okay, uh, next question from Ryan. He says, how likely are CBDCs to fail? And what will be the likely causes, uh, according to Doug, if they do fail? Hmm. We know in Nigeria, they've been trying really hard to get them implemented, and there was some rejection by Nigerians. Yeah, but here in the U.S., where everybody's got a social security number, and everybody's got a uh, credit card, and bank accounts, and all this type of thing, uh, and so many people get social security checks, and so forth. I mean, you know, the government's got a lot more control in the US than the Nigerian government does in Nigeria. So um, yeah, and of course, Americans are so programmed and you know, you offer them a, a free hundred Fed coin to open up their, get involved, of course they'll do it. I mean, it's like, it's like during the COVID hysteria, weren't they offering people a, a free hamburger if they got their shot or something like that? So, I mean, people are really kind of stupid. We're all stupid on some level. So um, I don't know if that answers the question or not. 
I don't know if this, look, they're gonna, they're, whatever, it doesn't matter. They're gonna inflate the currency to keep the ball rolling. They have to, they, they have to. It's the only way they can get income. I mean, they can't tax all that extra money they're spending. And it's a lot easier, and they think it's a good thing besides to just print up more money and direct it towards where they think is important. So, of course, it's going to happen. It'll, it'll, it'll be adopted, and it'll be a total disaster. Yeah, I mean, they could, they, I mean, if they adopt, if it was, if it was launched quietly in the background today, when people weren't aware of it, but it was there, um, the vast majority of transactions in the U.S. would be within that system already because they're electronic. So it can it can ha- it can happen. It would happen. It could happen in the background without even people being aware. You know what I mean? When they launch it. So yeah, and everybody everybody uses their smartphone. I mean, it's getting so that when you board a plane, they don't even want to give you a paper boarding pass. You've got to have a smartphone. To show them, I, I resist that uh, wholeheartedly, incidentally. But it's the same thing. People are very used to it. They think, "Oh, this is really convenient." Yeah, yeah. I don't. So, so bottom line is, you don't see it failing. You don't see the launch of central bank digital currencies, at least in the uh, the wealthy nations uh, like the U.S. and Sweden, European Union. You don't see that not happening. No, I don't see I, the launch will be successful. I believe, but. The consequences of it will be a total disaster because it's it's really uh, it it really lets the cat out of the bag. Where in point of fact, all they have to do is push a few buttons to do anything because it's all digitized totally at that point. I mean, with with real commodity money, they've got no control at all, and even with paper money, they've got a lot less control. But with totally digital money where everybody's using it on their phones and social credit system, which is upcoming in the same thing, they got total control. Uh, so it'll turn into a, a real dog's breast breakfast of a disaster, ultimately. But initially, I think I think people will like it. So too. I mean, uh, is, it, is it 50 million Americans or are, are beneficiaries of transfer payments of one kind or another? I mean, all they have yeah. to do is. Oh, that. I think it's much more than that. I think that's just the number for Social <laughs> Security and Medicare and Medicaid. Frankly, I it's got to be much more than that. Uh-huh. No, it's got to be much more than 16 percent. That's just that's right. just Medicare, probably. I, I or Social Security. Let's see. Yeah, I'll keep looking while we're doing this. But uh, okay, let me go to the next question. Well, and I'll look at that. Oh, where do you think is the best place today to build a real estate portfolio? Hmm. Well, I'm not sure there is one. But the answer is, if you're going to build a real estate portfolio, you know, it, it's always been said, you know, real estate is local. Well, maybe, maybe not. Um, because, you know, if you look around the world and you find a country or an area of the U.S., if you wanted to stay in the U.S., okay, that's fine. You can zero in on something that really looks cheap and good. But you're really going to have to go there, frankly, and become familiar with the market. And you're going to have to spend time there. I mean, you really are. So, so where do you go? I mean, I don't know personally of any, well, Argentina is ultra double cheap right now. It really is. But I mean, especially if you're trying to build a rental income around it, it has to be, so you can't use mortgages to buy it, right? So you have to be all cash buyer and your rents would be received most likely in the local currency, right? Yeah. And hopefully they'll go up, but you know, there are political problems and I hate to generalize. Okay. Yeah, real estate. I, I, can't, I can't put my finger on anything other than to tell you that if you want to buy something in Argentina right now, it's really cheap. Things might get possibly much, much better at the elections in October. And um, it's probably at the bottom anyway. 
But I don't know if that's going to be of much help unless you come to Argentina and spend months down there to become familiar, frankly. I did see a man on the street interview in uh, Buenos Aires, and the guy says, you know, who are you going to vote for? And the person answering says, Christina. And he said, well, he said, well, Christina's not running. And and this other guy said, okay, Millet. <laughs> yeah, polar opposites. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Like Winston Churchill said, the best argument against democracy is a five-minute conversation with the average voter. It's crazy. He said Malay is a good thing. It is, and it just makes me, yeah, I mean, I think there it could be a disaster, uh, be, but but it is amazing that they, uh, there's a good shot of that guy being elected, and he's a real ANCAP. Yeah, he really is, but, um, well, he's got, he's got his work cut off for him. Yeah. Yeah, public enemy number one. He'll be very quickly, I think. I mean, Matt, stop. I've got to walk off. And... All right, Doug. So uh, I was just looking up the some of the, the transfer payments, and there's 42.2 million people that currently receive SNAP benefits. That's the food stamps. Mm. 66 million receive Social Security benefits couple million that get uh, veterans benefits. So that's what I found so far. So yeah, all I have to do is pay those out, I think, through the central bank digital currency, and you're going to get you're going to get widespread adoption pretty quick. Yeah. And of course, they'll tie in all the people that receive state and local benefits uh, as well. They can, they can be hooked in pretty easy too, in addition. Yeah. So you don't have to use the, you don't have to use the stick on everything. You can use the carrot and the carrot seems to work pretty well with a lot of people. Yeah, it really does. Yeah, it works really well, especially when the average guy, you know, can't even get together a thousand dollars if he has an emergency. Exactly. Okay. Uh, next question is: With Germany now officially in recession, where do you see Europe in the next year? And with many European countries being some of the world's highest on a private debt to GDP. Well. I don't understand why anybody continues to work in Europe. I mean, it's a great place. It's like Disneyland with real buildings. I mean, with buildings made out of stone as opposed to paper mache. So I think it's great. Love the cafes and you know the scenery and blah, blah, blah. That's all great. But um, if you're trying to make a living in Europe, I just don't understand it with the taxes and regulations as bad as they are. Worse, much worse than the US in most cases. I mean, so if I was a rich European that didn't really have to work anymore, I would get the hell out. Because bad things are likely to happen in Europe. I mean, the uh, people that control the European Union are basically criminal personalities. And uh, there's still no way of telling how this war, this border war between Russia and the Ukraine is going to evolve. I mean, it's, it's unpredictable. So I, I don't see the attraction to Europe anymore, frankly. It's hard to see the rest of Europe not going into recession. But of course, with my gloomy outlook, it's hard to see every place not going into recession because of you know all the all the economic consequences of what's been done in the last several years. Yeah, exactly. It's it's going to be, it could be a bunch of dominoes push over the first one and they all fall down. It's weird. The, Germany was, you know, the like handled it the best um, in terms of not, they didn't have any, uh, any new spending orgies related to COVID as compared to like the U.S. or you know, other countries in Europe, like they were more restrained in their approach toward it. But so the first ones to go into recession, maybe they're just the most honest about their numbers. Well, perhaps. Uh, how much of what happens in Germany is controlled in Brussels and how much is controlled in Berlin these days? I'm uncertain, actually. Right. Yeah, I don't know either. Okay. Uh, back to the inflation versus deflation debate. What are your thoughts on impending deflation versus eventual inflation? Uh, the whole inflation thing seems to be uh, too much of a mainstream narrative. You know, we do see like the actual M2 money supply dropping substantially recently. 
So technically that is deflation, right? That is the, the, the definition of deflation, isn't it? When you see that? <clears throat> well, on the one hand, the Federal Reserve is going to have to continue buying US government debt to make up the trillion dollar deficit. I mean, the Chinese aren't gonna buy it anymore, that's for sure. Uh, so that's inflationary. But on the other hand, most of the inflation actually comes through the fractional reserve system, the retail banking system where people take out loans. And that's how the money supplies expanded on a boots on the ground uh, way. But uh, as interest rates have gone up so much, that's kind of a shock. They're not high right now. They're still negative in real terms, but they're a lot higher than they used to be. I mean, 6% is a lot higher than zero or 1%. So um, look, here, here's the problem. It's that they have to keep inflating. They can't let Bank of America or Wells Fargo or, or any of these big banks go bust for the same reasons or different reasons than Republic and, and, and SVP and those others went bust recently. Um, so they'll keep the big ones going. They're not gonna let General Motors go bust. It's too big to fail. But they'll let uh, Joe's Candy Store on the corner go bust. That's not too big to sell. So when you get lots of small businesses and medium-sized businesses, and not really large businesses failing, they default on their bonds. They stop paying their employees and their employees, you know, default on their credit card debt and all that. That's deflationary. The money just goes poof, dies and goes to money, money heaven. But it's the little guys that are deflate, deflating things because they can't borrow from the regional banks anymore and they get in trouble and nobody's going to bail them out. But the big money center banks and the big national corporations, they're fine. They'll, the inflation keeps going. So power is continuing to gravitate for that reason towards the rich and away from the middle class. I don't know if I've been clear. Yeah, that makes sense. That, that makes sense. But what do you do and, about uh, how, how do they keep expanding the money supply, though, when demand for loans goes down because mortgages are too expensive and the cost of housing is too expensive? So how, how does the Fed push money into the system if the banks aren't lending? Well, at that point, they have a problem. All they can do is keep a massive catastrophic deflation from happening by not letting any big institutions fail. Because let's say, um, let's say Wells Fargo goes bust, or that's not the best example. Well, let's say General Motors goes bust again, which I think it will. And they have, I don't know, $50 billion, I, I don't even know, uh, of bonds outstanding. Well, what happens to that $50 billion if GM is not going to pay them anymore? It dies and goes to money heaven. Well, they can't let that happen. That's $50 billion. That's a whole bunch of corner candy stores to make up that difference and little consumer loans taken out. So that's all they can do is they can uh, put their finger in the big holes in the dike, but the little holes in the dike, they really can't because of what you just said. So it's not over yet. I'm still betting on much more inflation because the government basically, the dollars and I owe you nothing. The government controls the dollars, basically, notwithstanding the fact that people may not borrow and local banks may not lend still. So yeah, I, I've got to come down on 90% chance of much higher inflation, 10% chance of a 1929 style deflation. You could have both inflation and deflation at the same time, can't you, in different areas? I mean, the way it's experienced, technically inflation is increasing the money supply, technically deflation is a decrease the money supply, but the way what we colloquially call inflation and deflation, you could observe that at the same exactly. time. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, look at food, for instance. Uh, rich get richer. Price of steak goes up. Poor get poorer. Price of rice and beans goes down. 
because they're going to tighten this, you know, tighten their belts even further. So yeah, that can happen too. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Next question. Uh, is Uruguay considering signing the WHO's pandemic treaty? I don't know. Do you, are you up to date on that? I, last I heard was that they, that they were, there was no, uh, that they were, were planning on it. Not that there was no co confirmation that they were going to plan on it, but because there was no spoken resistance to it. Um, but I don't know. I'll have to look it up, see what I can find out about it, what the latest is. Yeah. Well, like one of the reasons, I, I, I mean, look, Uruguay is just another Latin American country, with sociologically stable, but you know the people here aren't like rocket scientists. I mean, they voted in a, an income tax on themselves via a plebiscite. It wasn't the parliament that did it. It was the people that voted in it. So you know, these, it's not like these people have average IQs of 120 or something. They don't. So yeah, they could do that easily down here. Like. Um, one of the reasons that the government, one of the reasons the government pushed for an income tax, I understand, is because um, uh, the European Union wasn't, was loath to give them automatic visa rights because there wasn't an income tax here. They wanted, the EC wanted an income tax in, uh, in Uruguay. So they said, okay, well, we'll put in an income tax and that'll, make our passport, you know, who knows what's going on between these people. It's, it's a big club and we ain't done it. Yeah. I mean, I think the big thing that I like about Uruguay and compared to other places, uh, at least the U S and maybe and some European countries is that the ability to enforce policies is definitely very different here than what you'd see in the U S like just some of the, some of the things that they imagine you know, some of the things that the policies and the, the regulations in the U.S. are so insane and they would never, they couldn't fool themselves here that, you know, that they that anyone would follow it because they have no enforcement ability. But the U.S. has a lot of enforcement power. Yeah, the U.S. has huge enforcement power within and without its borders. That's, that's true. Okay, so a couple more questions, Doug. Uh, let's see. Do you have any thoughts on Ecuador's political situation it says lasso is, as a six-month monarch has already made some very interesting moves the past few days such as a tax haven slash economic zone and other policies well i've been to ecuador a couple of times uh and i understand there's a significant uh foreign community mostly gringos and canadians and americans in cuenca point mountain place but uh am i a fan of uruguay generally ecuador, ecuador. Oh, excuse me ecuador a tiny little country on the pacific coast not the atlantic coast right uh, no because ecuador is indian country and indian country is dangerous if you're a gringo and the natives are getting restless so I hope they do some good things, but um, not sure. Okay. I haven't been following the situation there, so I'll have to read up on it. Okay, next question. Um, so this question, is, uh, it says, people say the U.S. debt is too high, and they use debt to GDP as the rationale. He says he takes exceptions to it because you know, this is like comparing debt to sales for a company. It's true the sales, aka the tax revenue of the US, are about you know three trillion and expenditures are four trillion, so it's a trillion dollar deficit. So the 32 trillion in debt will grow and grow under current conditions. If the assets of the US government are say 32 trillion or less, then they are bankrupt, and that's obvious. But if the assets are 500 trillion, for instance, the situation is bad and heading in the wrong direction, but it's not dire straits yet. He said, what are the potential and what are the potential assets of the U.S. government? This may include all natural resources within the borders, current infrastructure, goodwill, et cetera. Goodwill is a bullshit indicator of all things. But uh, this includes uh, current assets plus whatever the U.S. government can nationalize or take by force. So 
he said, I would agree the situation in the, US, in the US looks bad and is heading in the wrong direction, but in a real corporate analysis, one must not compare the PL directly to the balance sheet of the country or not conflate them. Well, that is a very problematical question. I mean, on many levels. To start with, the questioner is conflating the US government with the US. They're two different entities. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the US government is as separate from the US as General Motors is from the US. So uh, General Motors problems should not be the problems of the average American. And the problems of the US government shouldn't either. It's not we the people anymore. That's, that's, that's a nonsense. And then he, some of the numbers that, that he mentioned just there, it's like, um, he said, and, and the U.S. can confiscate, what do you say, confiscate stuff yeah. that people own? Exactly. Well, it has all the natural resources that are in the U.S., so all the, you know, unmined resources, all those, plus all the, uh, uh, yeah, definitely all whatever they could nationalize. Nationalize. Well, this is, look, taxes are theft, basically. They're just so yeah, if you nationalize something, it's just taxing on a really big scale. And you can make it legal, of course, by passing a law. This is insane. Uh, and if the US, let's say the US government to support itself nationalized uh, all of the publicly traded companies in the country from Google and Microsoft and NVIDIA, God forbid, uh, down to, you know, the smallest penny stock, I guess they estimate that all the stocks traded in the US are worth about $45 trillion at this point. So yeah, I guess you could pay off the US government's debt by nationalizing and stealing all of that. But paying off the US government's debt, I'm all for defaulting on the US government's debt. And I think it was, what, two or three editions of this ago, I think I gave six reasons why the U.S. government should default on it, because it's going to default on it eventually. It's going to happen one way or another. So it's ridiculous. Forget about the U.S. government maintaining itself in good health. It's not. It's a terminal cancer case. And the longer it survives in its present form, the worse off we're all going to be. Right. And if, if a nation considers any asset it can take by force, its property and as a uh, like part of its balance sheet, then like what would prohibit the U.S. from counting, uh, you know, Saudi Arabian oil stocks, at, you know, on our balance sheet? Because technically our military can go in there and take it if we want it. That's right. That would solve the problem right there. Why don't we invade Saudi Arabia and capture all the oil? And yeah, that solves the problem. That's hey, that's that's a thought. Yeah, they definitely don't want to conflate the balance sheet of uh, you know the the, the uh, all the resources within the national borders to being assets of the state. That's a mistake. Okay. Well, maybe they'll all let us keep our individual houses if they're not too large for a while, at least for well, a while. As long as you're willing to update them and make sure that they accommodate new green standards, as they're doing in France, allegedly. Well, that kind of goes without saying. <laughs> of course. All right. Uh, Doug, did you meet the character uh, Sabina? And I can't remember what her last name was right now. Sabina in real life. That was This is a character, a very famous character in your, in your book series. Um, if you've read the book, you know who I'm talking about. Have, did you ever actually meet someone like her in real life? Yes, Sabina Heidel. She's Charles Knight's nemesis. And uh, yes, I think I have met uh, a number of Sabinas because I lived in Washington, D.C. for years, uh, a couple of decades, actually. Shame, I'm ashamed to say. Um, and cities like Washington are full of Sabinas. Um, well, not full of them. And then you've got examples of Sabinas in today's world. Uh, you can look at, who's that woman that runs the EU? Von der Leyen. Right. Ursula. She's gotta, gotta, gotta be a Sabina. 
And the one that runs the IMF, her name is Lagarde. Lagarde. Christine, Christine Lagarde. Undoubtedly, both Sabinas. You know, physically attractive, smart, slick, really dangerous, poisonous reptiles. Uh, and I would I would like to say that uh, Janet Yellen, could she be a Sabina lookalike? Uh, certainly not a lookalike because she's just too dumpy. I mean, Sabina Heidel would never, nobody would say, that broad ought to be working in back of the pastrami counter in a deli. They'd never say that about Sabina, but they could say that about Janet Yellen. I say it about her all the time. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but, you know, then we've got to look at classical female uh, nemeses, uh, villains. And uh, James Bond, uh, Ian Fleming, in his James Bond books, uh, he had a number of them. Uh, his heroines that James hooked up with uh, were uh, always, uh, you know, quite uh, quite attractive. Well, Pussy Galore being the not known of them, probably. And the, the female uh, nemeses, the evil females, uh, were dumpy. They looked like Janet Yellen. And they had names like Irma Bunt and um, Rosa Klebb. So uh, he, was, he was quite good naming his female villains. But uh, if I ever met them, yeah. Uh, I've just never gotten most of them. I kind of recoil from people like that. Yeah, you know, Chris McIntosh was saying on Twitter, uh, responding to a video from um, von der Leyden, he said, why is it when she smiles, I can only see her canines? I think that's all. <laughs> well, that's, that's very good. Yeah. Well, and the whole world is becoming feminized, where you have these, you know, women run half the countries in Europe now and run the EU and the IMF and Treasury. Women are everywhere. They've taken over from men. I mean, what good do men, what useful purpose do men serve anymore? To service the women? But, you know, increasingly, if I was a young man, I question whether I'd want to get into a relationship with a woman. It would be dangerous on many levels today. Not fun, potentially dangerous. Well, could be fun, of course. But, and when you're young, you don't look at the danger side of the menu so much. Well, there's but, a whole... The whole movement, uh, they, it's called um, MGTOW, I think, Men Go Their Own Way, which is all about that. Basically, just like, forget about the women. Just focus on, you know, improving yourself and, uh, you know, and basically building a life, uh, I mean, more or less, uh, without sex. Certainly away from well, women, committing to women, at least. Well, that's true. I mean, you know what they say, if it flies, floats, or... You should rent, not buy. And, um, you know, most marriages end in divorce, and the divorces are usually very prejudicial against the uh, male part of the equation. So uh, perhaps increasingly, it's something a lot of young men are thinking, I got to stay away from that. And um, I was talking to my wife the other day about this, and she pointed out, because she reads, reads a lot. Uh, pointed out that, especially in Japan, for some reason, Japan is weird and strange for a lot of reasons along these lines, that um, many, many young Japanese men under the age of 30 uh, don't want to have anything to do with women. Yeah. That's spreading, spreading everywhere. And, you know, I'd like, uh, clearly there's risk with getting married. I understand that. I mean, I'm a divorced person. I understand. But you can do things to plan it, you know, to, you can, to, to, to de-risk it, I guess. I mean, there's plenty that can be done to de-risk it, you know, if you're willing to set expectations right and, and prenup, obviously. So, but I, I think marriage is good and I think having kids is good. That's my stance on it. Risky, sure, but lots of good things are risky. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, all things considered, it's, it's a good thing. And at a certain stage of your life, you can be, um, you know, you can be rogue. You can be kind of a 
mild-mannered James Bond type or Armand Flint type. I mean, they never get married. But um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, throughout many, many thousands of years of history, marriage has made sense. Although it's always been an economic institution more than anything else. So even from that point of view, it makes sense. Well, if you plan things out properly. Yeah, yeah, it's it's tough. It's definitely difficult to do it right. So I'm speaking of someone who's failed. Uh, but let's see, what, Doug, last question for you is, what are you doing this summer? What's the plan? You're are you traveling this summer? Are you going to be in, uh, I know you're heading up to Virginia relatively soon. Any other summer yeah. plans, conferences, anything? One thing that is not in my plans anymore is going to conferences. I think I'm pretty well through with conferences. And even when I get paid a reasonable buck, I don't want to go to conferences and take days and days out of my life and, you know, wander around convention floors. I'm not doing that. Like I'm not going to Freedom Fest. First time ever. First time ever. I'm not going to do that. Uh, and I don't think I'm going to go to the New Orleans conference this year. Also be a first, wouldn't it? That would also be a first. I've been going to that for um, most of my adult life. So uh, I'll do these things video, but um, nope, not going to go anywhere. When I get back to uh, Virginia, uh, the most of the travel I'm going to do is I might pop up to Washington, D.C. to see a friend or two, maybe. Uh, if I can't talk them into coming down to visit me. And I'll drive to the local towns to uh, various upmarket beaneries. But uh, no, I've been everywhere. I've been absolutely just about everywhere, usually many times. So I can actually say with sincerity and accuracy, been there, done that. So <laughs> I got, <laughs> no, so I don't have any travel plans. No, forget about that. Okay. What am I gonna what am I gonna do? Go to uh you know go to, yeah, go, go to London and you know wander ride around. The, ride the double decker bus around for the tour, been back. Yeah. yeah. No, I have been there, done that. Sorry. <laughs> well, apparently, apparently uh tourism is nuts right now. I mean, I know a lot of people who are in Europe right now and people who there who told me that it is crazy, like it's so busy everywhere. I've heard that too. I've heard that too. So that's another good reason not to be touring. I mean, I've said many times in the past that when I did go someplace, I'd prefer going places that had State Department advisories out so that the crowds weren't there anymore. It was much so much better to do that. So I'm a contrarian from that point of view. Yeah, that's a lot. But I think it, it was either 2008 or 2009 that I went to. Um... I went to Italy for the first time and it was because of the financial crisis. There was almost no tourism, you know, so I'm walking along the streets of Florence and it's, you know, just a couple of people, but it's, it's mostly dead and most mostly locals. And I thought it was wonderful, wonderful. And then I, and then I, I've been back several times and it's just gotten it, the last time I was there, it was awful. I mean, you, you can't even walk on the street. All the sidewalks are completely packed this, you know, the street, uh, you can't even, I mean, you can't move. And it's staying in line for hours to go to an art gallery. It's ridiculous. Yeah, forget about tourism travel these days. Listen, it was one thing if you were like Marco Polo, where you were the only guy out there, but it's something else where there's hordes of foreigners with their iPhones and cameras. Well, they don't have cameras, they have iPhones. You know, forget about it. I mean, it's totally different. I'm so glad that... I did a lot of traveling, a lot, a lot, when, you know, it wasn't like something on your bucket list. And when there wasn't a, a Starbucks or a McDonald's on every block, everywhere in no. the world. No, exactly. And all these places are starting to look alike just for that reason besides. So, no, traveling, Tourism. of course, on the downside, it's that if people want to travel these days, um, it's going to become harder and harder once once world health passports are put into effect. And 
Yeah, it's almost like you got to get it in now if you if you want to do it because you don't have as yeah, pretty much. But someplace you really want to go, you really want to see, better do it now before the world health passports come out and international airlines are much harder to deal with now than they were before the COVID hysteria. It's a shame the world's changing. Is the thing about tourism though is like traveling now. It all feels like a it's a product that's sold to you like it's like a Disney ride. You know what I mean? There is no, there. It, you have to really try to get uh, to get off the beaten path. You know, to not be, um, you know, to to experience the unexpected. And most of these places now is just it's very, uh, it's so or organized around tourism that you're basically just going on a Disney park ride. Is what it feels like to me. Yeah, and you can't get off the Disney. You can't get off the beaten path because <clears throat> I've uh, I've never had a desire to try to climb Mount Everest. But my understanding is that when you climb it and get to the peak, it's like a junkyard up there now. Yeah, and you're it's a line too. You're standing in line to get up to. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah so yeah, I, 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 exactly. What's the point? You're wandering around a real life Disneyland with lots of other tourists that are just wandering around too. Exactly. Yeah. I think exactly. I think it makes more sense to uh, be a prepper living in your compound and do all the stuff from the comfort of your own home. Yeah, I think so too. Or you know, I did do the RV thing for a while. I thought that was good, and I still have my RV. But like, that's not a bad way to to vacation that's differently that's different you know but you're obviously limited to uh a place any places you can drive to yeah and you're still in the u.s which is oh. okay i mean i like the i like the u.s i mean i still do that's why i'm going back there in the summer it has upside it has upside it does it does i mean after a while you you do miss a walmart when you need to get some new socks or something I walked into a Home Depot and I'm like, they sell so much shit here. It's unbelievable. <laughs> like, I would love to have this. But well, it's that, not and that is, that's one of the disadvantages of living in in other countries. If if you need something for your house, like you, what you'd want to get at the Home Depot, it's not really possible. I mean, it's not easy anyway. Much harder. Like, at home, it's amazing. It's and it just shows like how like Americans and I'll just say. I, it's very difficult to appreciate the miracle of the global trade and distribution system that exists. It's it's actually amazing. And you only really notice it when it's gone or when you don't have access to it. So I don't know. God, I, I, can't wait, I can't wait to see how the world's going to sort out in the next five or 10 years. It's it's going to be just fascinating. This incidentally, for those that are wondering, that are stuck with this, this is uh, one of my two female poodles. Her name is uh, Lovey Dovey, and she's a Ukrainian bar girl in her alter ego. And uh, she consorts with uh, the Mama Poodle, who is a Russian nurse. So they get along very well, except when they talk Great. about- Russian and Ukrainian can get along? Well, she's a bar girl, so she doesn't have strong opinions on this. <laughs> <laughs> that's great all right okay i think we'll leave it there for today doug um thank you very much and we'll be back next week with more okay great man <laughs>